Rachel Edidin. And I'm Miles Stokes. And we're the hosts of Rachel and Miles Explain the X-Men, a weekly podcast all about the ins, outs, and retcons of our very favorite superhero soap opera. We're also the hosts of Rachel and Miles Review the X-Men. Which you're watching right now. Where we talk about the X-Books that come out each week. This week we are looking at the week of July 1st, 2015, and these are, I think this is actually the heaviest week we've had so far in uh, Secret Wars. We've got a total of five books. I think it might be. Uh, we also have another video if you're looking for our thoughts on the new post-Secret Wars Marvel books. You should check that one out. Right, and we'll link to that in the comments below. We're keeping those separate just for disambiguation because I imagine there are folks who want to see one and not the other. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, let's go. First up, we've got Secret Wars number four. It's written by Jonathan Hickman, drawn by Asad Ribic, with colors by Ivis Forchina. So we try to keep these reviews relatively spoiler-free, so to that end... So that happened. Okay, we can talk a little bit more about it. Uh, Rachel, go for it. Well, Secret Wars is the big central, you know, world-spanning book of the event, and it's been, for us, the absolute standout, um, and continues to be incredibly solidly good. Um, this is, you mentioned really loving Hickman on and really loving the way he's done the build-up and plot reveals. For oh, yeah. me, though, the absolute standout on this is the, the team of Ribic and Sportina, who are just doing a spectacular, moody, momentous job. Right. I mean, what a what an event like this should do is it should sell epic. And mm -hmm. that's an overused word. Everyone, everything is epic these days. But this series is epic. Half of that's the writing, half of that's the art. Everything just has such magnificent gravitas to it. And the pacing uh, is very much a beautiful juxtaposition between the writing of Hickman and the art of the artist and colorist. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I will say, and I want to I go back to Ribic because he's doing something that's been done before and it's been done well, but I think rarely with such nuance and variety. His Doctor Doom is so expressive. Right. For a guy with, you know, a big metal mask over his face, you really get just the, the triumph and the tragedy. I, I feel like we should always use overblown language when we talk about Doom, of, uh, of Victor Von Doom. Um, I mean, we talk about in our reviews and our podcast how hard it is mm -hmm. to draw Cyclops right, how hard it is to get his expressiveness without his eyes visible. Yeah, it's like that times three. Well, no, Doom. I was going to say it's a re perfectly reverse Cyclops, because literally all you can see of his face are his eyes. And oh, true, Rubik true. does so much with that and with body language and posture and just angling and panel composition. Um, and yeah, it's it's gorgeous. I mean, this is this is a guy whose artwork we first became very familiar with in his run on Thor, mm. which is, again, another book that, that I think you could accurately describe as soundly epic. And seeing even how far he's developed since then has been absolutely spectacular. As for this issue, um, it's a good thing that the creative team does Doom well because it's largely about mm -hmm. Doctor Doom and Doctor Strange and their dynamic, which is a fascinating one that I found compelling as hell. Well, it always is. I mean, I remember the, the Mignola draw on Doctor Strange and Doctor Doom Marvel graphic novel. Oh, yeah, that was great. Which was my introduction to both those characters, mm -hmm. and a large part of my love for both of those characters you know, right. stems from that. And so to have an issue that is so much talking heads and manage to mix it in perfectly with uh, just the usual over-the-top action that we're used to with forces this powerful is beautiful. At one point, guys, there's a Thor who's a boar, like the animal boar, not boring. Um, boar Thor? Uh, a, a boar Thor. B Thor, the boar. Anyway, and he talks about how lawlessness is a disease. And that was almost our panel of the week. It would have been if but it, it was, was just But it was not. Me. It was not. Um, but yeah, I mean, this book continues to be just this bizarre, strange, imaginative world where everything has huge weight. I mean, we all know that Secret Wars is going to end and things are going to largely be wiped clean, but but nonetheless, I find myself really invested in what's happening in this book. Next up is Extinction Agenda Number 2, written by Mark Guggenheim, with art by Carmine Dijon Domenico and colors by Nolan Woodard. And uh, once again, this book, I think, is a lot better than I was expecting. I hadn't really been a big fan of the work I'd seen with the creators previously, but they come together really nicely. I don't think it's as strong a book as Number 1 was, but it's still really engaging. Yeah, this was a series that very much started with a bang, and... The second issue isn't as good as the first, but I think it would have been difficult to keep that level of energy. For me, a big factor in that is that this is very much a group fight scene issue, and that is an area where that is, is not Dijon Domenico's strength at all. Mm -hmm. But there is some really cool uh, plotty stuff as well. One of the things I've been enjoying about Secret Wars is getting to explore the nuances and details of these strange worlds to which we're introduced. And one of the things I really enjoyed here, minor spoiler, is uh, in the 616 universe, the main universe, Beast brought back the original five X-Men, to kind of make things right. In this universe, he brought back the X-Men from the Giant Size era who had died, uh, basically before they had died, to give them another chance, which well, is kind of cool. some of them. Uh, some of them, yes, but, you know, like Wolverine and Banshee and stuff. Um, so it's interesting. What we mainly see, though, is Havoc and the other Genosian sort of rebels uh, going through with their plan to kidnap a healer from the mainstream X-Men, 
and it is it is dark. Just seeing how desperate Havoc is and what he's willing to do to make this happen is a little horrifying and a little fascinating. Yeah, I continue to very, very much like Guggenheim's take on Havoc. He's a character who's very, very well, or very, very rarely well written and very rarely consistently written. And this take is, is I think, consistent with some of the best prior versions. Mm -hmm. What I like about him in this is you see the sort of uh, grim determination and desperation that we see in modern Scott Summers in his sort of revolutionary leader role, but not identical. He still feels like Alex Summers. You just realize that there's something in that Summers' blood that can lead people to be a little scary when things get tough. Next up is Giant Size Little Marvel Avengers vs. X-Men number two. It's a mouthful of a title. Written and drawn by Scotty Young and colored by Jean-Francois Bolio. And, you know, I feel like we kind of covered this last time and nothing has really changed. Mm -hmm. And that this is delightful. It's basically a kid's cartoon. It's the kind of interstitial repeating short that you'd expect to see in something like Animaniacs or Tiny Toons Adventures, which should perfectly date us if you're not aware of how, you know, how old <laughs> we happen to be. Um, and it remains delightful and charming and wonderful. Um, I have not been reading this with young kids, but the people I know who have say that they have been very much enjoying it, which I find utterly unsurprising. As an adult reader who is into ridiculous Marvel inside jokes, continuity, and satire, I've also been enjoying it a lot. Yeah, it's definitely a two-levels thing. I think, though, if uh, Scotty Young is prioritizing, he probably is prioritizing towards children, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think I that's mean, an awesome thing. Yeah. Again, I think the comparisons to like Tiny Toons and Adventures in Animaniacs and that, that specific era of Warner Brothers animation is a fairly apt one because it's fun and it's accessible and it's mad cap if you're a kid and if you're an adult there's a whole second layer of text in there just for you yes also you get a chance to see ghost rider having dinner with his ghost rider parents which i never realized was a hole in my life waiting to be filled but now it has thank you scotty young yeah there it's... are a lot of cameos and sort of mm -hmm. cute gags scattered throughout if again if you're just a fan of, of marvel and the marvel universe and its continuity and its characters and you know fun silly takes on them i'm gonna say if you enjoy fun things on tumblr you're gonna like this book yeah, I would agree. If you are an, an uh, if you're into X Men for only the super serious feels, though, you should probably give this one a skip because there is nothing super serious about it at all. Next is Years of Future Past, number two, written by Marguerite Bennett with art by Mike Norton and colors by Fco Placencia. So the first issue of Years of Future Past felt very much like a third issue of the Days of Future Past storyline from a long, long time ago. And it's not a bad thing. It managed to capture the feel, the themes, the characters, even certain artistic ticks really well. What I like about Years of Future Past number two is that it then continues. It shows us more of that world. It goes deeper into, I guess, the philosophy of it. Uh, I, I guess sort of the repercussions of violence, the insidiousness of subtle bigotry and how that can grow into something larger, uh, how that can, you know, build a world, build a new generation. Like, it gets very thinky in a way that I was not expecting it to do, and it does it really effectively. We also get to see a lot more of the world of Years of Future Past, as opposed to just, you know, what's going on around the mutants who are rebelling at the time. Um, Rachel, you were saying that you really dug uh, Centrum, the mutant refugee refuge that we see? Oh, well, I was saying specifically that it re reminded me a whole, whole lot of a specific place from Age of Apocalypse. Oh, right, uh, Angel's Bar, where he was sort of the proprietor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's, he's basically the leader of, of Centrum as well, which is very cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I continue to enjoy this series a lot. It's not just let's rehash a popular story, it's let's rehash a popular story and then go from there to build something new with new interesting characters and also possibly the best written Colossus I've seen in freaking ages. I love the way Bennett does Rasputin. So, uh, yeah, great book, highly recommended. Keep picking it up. Finally, we have Battle World Secret Wars Journal number three. Now, there is a directly X relevant story in here. It's who, who Killed Tony Stark, and it's a fun noir mystery starring Wolverine, written by Frank Thierry and drawn by Richard Eisenhoff. But you know what? I'm not going to review it. It's fun, it's cool, it's a noir Wolverine detective story. If you like those things, you will like it. I am going to review the other story in here because it's weird and you might not notice it otherwise. That is The Smashing Cure. It is written by Scott Aukerman, it is drawn by R.B. Silva, and it is colored by Guru EFX. And it is a Doc Sampson story, and I love Doc Sampson, and you should love Doc Sampson too, because he is delightful. He is basically therapist to the Marvel Universe, and when you stick him in a world where literally everyone is a Hulk, everyone who freaks out, you know, goes Hulk and goes ultraviolent, you get one of the most charming stories to come out of this title so far. The art is lovely, it's cartoonish, it's really expressive, it actually, weirdly and specifically, reminds me of, of Dylan McConus and the way she draws faces. Huh, okay, okay. Um, in, in very, very good ways, um, and does a lot to humanize a story that otherwise, that is, is specifically all about the juxtaposition between humans and monsters. 
Um, it's charming, it's really fun, and it is absolutely not something I expected to stumble across today. So again, good Wolverine story, solid noir, not particularly groundbreaking. Get this one for the Doc Sampson. So that's five out of five. Miles, what's our issue of the week? I think that's going to have to be Years of Future Past number two, as good as Secret Wars number four was. Um, the art managed to age, manages to age the characters beautifully while keeping their body language and personalities. The writing manages to take a really cool dystopian story and make it much smarter and more philosophical than I was expecting. It's a really engaging, cohesive package of a comic, and I'm very, very excited that Marguerite Bennett and the art team is having a chance to do it. Check it out. What about our panel of the week? Our panel of the week is, I think, unsurprisingly, from Secret Wars number four. And we had we found a bunch of really good ones this week, but this was the one that we were both absolutely agreed on in that lineup. And this is partly for the drama and composition of it, but largely just because of the way that Sforchina and Ribic draw Phoenix. Like, this is... This gets across just how much is going on there. Right. This is a book where everything is epic, and seeing Cyclops slash Phoenix drawn in a way that seems to dwarf everything around him in terms of power, scale, and magnificence is no mean feat. Well, and in terms of light, again, you know, we talk about colorists a lot, and I think what Sforchina brings to this book cannot be overestimated. I mean, this is, this is just, just the, the, the light and intensity of the panel is, is so much of, of its impact. Mm-hmm. So that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen here, please check out our podcast, Rachel and Miles Explain the X-Men. New episodes go up every Sunday at rachelandmiles.com, also on iTunes and Stitcher. What have we got for them this week? So this time around, we're talking about Louise Simonson's first few issues of X-Factor. She takes over from Bob Layton. We see Apocalypse show up uh, for the first time outside of Shadows. We see two of the saddest radioactive mutants ever. And we see things head toward the mutant massacre where everything is going to be terrible. Check it out. That podcast, these video reviews, and everything at rachelandmiles.com are brought to you by our very cool Patreon supporters. We are an entirely listener-supported and ad-free project. If you want to join the folks who make that possible, you can do it at the link either above or below this video, depending on where you're watching. In the meantime, please check out the other video we're putting up today, which is talking about Marvel's post-Secret War X lineup, or at least the part they've already announced. It's the first five books, I think, right? Uh, yes, indeed, the first five. So uh, check that out as well. In the meantime, we will see you next time back... As always, this summer in Battle World. Um, so should we do a tag? No, screw it. It's too hot. <laughs>